Good morning and welcome to Advanced Governance Mechanism. This is the Contract Negotiator's Toolbox, a series of three webinars covering topics that my clients often struggle with the most and find the greatest benefit from mastering. As I said, this is the third in the series. So the first was total cost of ownership. The second was service level agreements and other forms of monitoring and metrics. I've designed this webinar to look at a more advanced governance mechanism or mechanisms, there's a couple, and these mechanisms are appropriate for highly interdependent customer service relationships, service supplier relationships, so highly interdependent customer service supplier relationships. If you would like um, information on other forms of less sophisticated governance mechanisms, please go to my YouTube channel and watch my video on 21st Century Governance. These webinars are being recorded and you'll get a link to the webinar after the session is over. So let's go ahead and get started. I am Jeanette Nyden, for those of you who don't know. I am the author and co-author of three books, including Getting to E, Vested Outsourcing, and Negotiation Rules. And I work with supply chain professionals on the sales side and on the buy side. I offer training, coaching, and one-on-one -on -one mentoring. This is a com um, complexity and supplier governance maturity model, and I'm using this with permission of KPMG. It was presented at a conference a few years ago, a uh, conference that I attended. This model is closely aligned to the sourcing continuum. So as many of you know, if you follow my work, that I look at sourcing relationships between customers and suppliers along a sourcing continuum from transaction typically the least interdependent and the most simple in terms of contractual complexity, although you can have contractually complex transactions. And then as you move up in a similar fashion as to the arc on this slide, you get more complex relationships, preferred vendor, single or source, single or sole source providers, you can get alliance agreements and then joint partnerships. Each level of those relationships also is reflected on here in terms of maturity and complexity going from low to high, levels one through five. What I'd like to do is look at level three and then moving to what a level five model would look like. So level three is consistent. Formalized processes, reporting, and roles in places, it's documented and it's repeatable, and I'll show you what that actually looks like. And then when you move all the way up to governance excellence, you are looking for a scalable framework, and I'll show you how the slides can be scaled, or the uh, roles can be scaled in a slide a little bit later. It is fully implemented with compliance, and it supports a strategy and supplier decision making, and that's really critical. Is how do we move from looking back at our metrics and as a form of government governance, and how do we look forward into supplier? insight. So how do we start partnering in the market with our suppliers in different ways? How do we start moving and shifting in a market because of the relationships that we have with suppliers and the capabilities that they have through the governance mechanism of existing relationships? So we establish a level of trust. We establish a level of performance that allows us to move into a much more strategic interdependent relationship or alliance. This is our agenda for today. I'm going to talk about why establish a level three governance in the first place. Then I'm going to, it's very brief. Then I'm going to talk about governance costs money, so budget for it. I'm going to show you a way that one company did budget for it, get approval for it. Look at best practices in developing a level three governance, and I've got some examples. So when I talk about best practices, I'm actually going to show you spreadsheets and then how to move to a level five governance. And I've got a metrics example of how you can start to track for that kind of interdependency. And at the very end, we'll take questions. So why establish a level three governance model? All right, so the goal is to design and institutionalize an effective governance structure to deliver strategic insight. This is critical. You want to institutionalize it. People who are unfamiliar with working within a highly collaborative customer supplier relationship find it easier to fall into a familiar tug of war mentality. And a sound governance structure provides a set of cohesive policies, processes, and decision making rights that encourage collaboration and cooperation. 
So the goal is to institutionalize it, and by that I mean have a system in place that works despite the fact that key individuals may leave their position or leave the organization. So we don't want governance to be dependent on a champion, or we don't want it to be dependent on a person's role or title. I have seen way too many times, even in mid-negotiations, with key employees and champions moving roles or moving companies, and then the um, relationship flounders. And what we want to do is we want to establish something that can support the relationship without having to worry about whether one key or two key employees leave that relationship. Another problem is the new sheriff in town ailment, and it's real. My colleague Kate Vitasic wrote an article, and the link is in the slide um, at her www.vestedway.com website. The new sheriff in town occurs when a new leader joins a buying company and wants to shake things up. So I'll give you an example from 2012 that was in the newspapers. In 2012, General Motors and its newly minted CIO, Randy Mott, made the decision to insource 90% of its IT work. At the time Mott made the decision, AP had that work as an outsourced service provider. HP, which won GM Supplier of the Year Award in 2010 and 2011 for its dedication and loyalty to GM, was removed. HP lost approximately $1 billion, with a B, in revenue and let go of hundreds of employees as a result. While this is an extreme example, I'm sure all of you can tell me a story about a leader that left and a new leader that's wanting to shake things up and not understanding how the relationship works. Those shakeups do not go well, and I've personally been involved in them. And a level three governance structure can help put that structure in place to stabilize the relationship and not have it be so vulnerable to the whims of one person coming in and wanting to shake up a relationship. We also want to prevent strategic drift. Now, this is huge because if you're truly, truly in a interdependent customer-supplier relationship, then what you have is a strategic direction that both companies need to move in for probably a three- or five-year horizon, not a quarter-by-quarter -quarter horizon. And strategic dr drift occurs when buyers and service providers don't work to maintain the relationship and update the strategic priorities. So that means we're looking back at our KPIs and our metrics, which are all backwards looking. What did we do last month, last quarter, last year, or even rolling indicators, but backwards focus. Then we go, as this picture shows, and we break off from where we're supposed to be, and we start to drift off. This typically happens after a first-generation contract has been successful and senior management checks out, right? They go on to other initiatives and they leave the strategic relationship to manage, quote-unquote, on its own. Now, if you have governance mechanisms in place, it should be able to manage its own. If it's dependent on a personality, it won't, okay? But at the time of negotiation, you've got to put a governance structure in place. So some ideas about what strategic excuse me, what a drift means, things that I've seen, QBRs are not scheduled as frequently or not as all. So I've gone in to relationships and I'll start interviewing people. When's the last governance meeting? Oh, it was six months ago, nine months ago. The topics begin to slip and it's all about anecdotal past behavior and it does not have any data to support those conclusions. We stop running surveys, we stop running reports or bringing reports. Service providers lose sight of priorities and are reactive rather than proactive, so they're just making whoever they happen to report to happy in the day, not necessarily with respect to larger initiatives. Okay, and then that issue leads to the service provider looking like they're not doing their job because remember, we only pay attention to what we measure. So if you're not measuring the right things, you're not paying attention to what the service provider is or is not doing, and then that can lead to the replacement of the service provider. But it really is, from my perspective, because this is happening right now with one of my clients, an issue of a lack of governance structure. And so my client on the buy side is exiting a relationship. It may be completely and utterly valid, but I strongly believe that the lack of governance made it inevitable. So in other words, they could not even repair it if they wanted to because they didn't have a governance structure in place to be able to do that. Governance costs money, so budget for it. 
so there is no free lunch. <laughs> Sorry for the little bit of black humor, the cheese in the mousetrap. Governance is not free. You've got to devote the right resources to it. One of my clients freaked out because their account manager on the, on the service provider side wasn't de dedicating enough of his hours to them, and I had to be the one to say, but you're not paying for it. It's not in the structure. He doesn't owe you 40 hours a week full time. That's not how the account is structured. So you are disappointed, and that's really valid. To get that kind of time, you've got to budget it into the governance structure. Many companies initially think, well, we can't put that kind of money into it. I'm not going to pay $100,000 for this account manager to be full-time on my account. However, research tells us that without proper governance, companies experience up to 90% of deal value erosion and savings leakage. So the company that didn't want to pay for the account manager as part of an outsourced service provider agreement, uh, North America-wide, um, did in fact find that value leakage to be quite tremendous and quite problematic. And so there is a direct correlation. You're not going to get the value, the continuous improvement, the partnership, the strategic goals aligned and on time if you don't pay for some form of governance. So this is what it looks like from uh, a study that was done. And it is, uh, unfortunately, it's very tiny and it's at the bottom. And when this study was done, although it is a couple of years ago, what that looked at is the cost of getting to the contract is between 4%, excuse me, 0.4% and 2.5% of the total contract value. The annual cost of ongoing outsourcing management is between 3% and 8% of contract value. Okay, the average being 4 So offshore outsourcing costs even more in the range of 12 to 15% of contract value. So when I speak of level three governance, I'm talking about the point at which you transition, manage, and refresh the work. So it's the brown and then it goes back into the orange again. And by that, what I mean is you're managing the work so the buying company meets its business objectives from the relationship. You're refreshing the work so you're removing work that is duplicative or that doesn't need to be done or was promised that it wasn't going to be done as part of the service provider's promises to your company around continuous improvement. And then you track that through the metrics and KPIs throughout the duration of the relationship. And so then if you're going to actually do that to get to that um, point, I would say you need to put 3 or 5% of contract value off to the side for governance. All right. So this is one pricing model that a company used, and it's um, an example that's written about both in the Vested Outsourcing Manual that I co-authored and Getting to We. Um, in this situation, the cost of governance, the cost of the supplier's people to focus exclusively on the management of the customer's strategic initiatives as part of the relationship, attend all the governance meetings, whether they were quarterly, regional, annual, um, strategic meetings, it was set out in the pricing model as a fixed fee, and that gave both companies transparency as to the true cost to manage this outsourcing relationship. Now, in this slide, this is what my company client actually did, so I'll slow down here for a minute. So we had this example, right? Pricing model secures the A team. That was the slide that was just before us. So that was generic, right? Okay, it's a fixed fee. Well, what does that fixed fee look like and how do both companies try to wrap their arms around it? So what my clients did, and it was really amazing, um, I really give a lot of credit to the folks that came up with um, the numbers on this, but the following, they created new roles. They wanted a transformation manager full-time. They wanted for both the customer and the supplier. They wanted this outsourcing relationship to take um, significant costs out of the relationship, redundancies, waste, you name it. And there was a lot to be had, but not if they didn't devote the staff. So what they did is they asked, so the customer asked the supplier, we want a transformation manager and we want you to have a customer vendor manager. So that means that that person was going to manage to the customer, my client, and then back down to all the third-party vendors that they were managing. The supplier came back and said, we'll devote the resources if you devote a transformation manager full-time so that there's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship because we fear we'll hire someone and they'll not have the attention of a dedicated employee. So these were new, net, and required roles to implement the governance framework. Okay. 
So this is how we were able to leverage and get the enormous amount of savings that the service provider was promising. And this was um, third generation outsourcing. So all the quote unquote easy hanging fruit had been picked and we were left with more strategic initiatives to get that transformation. And so what this looked like is that there were going to be two managers for a total of 250 each, so 125 each, and then a customer manager, uh, vendor, customer vendor manager, excuse me, at 125, okay? And then a governance administrator that was going to be shared, meaning they were going to hire an assistant. Um, I believe the service provider was going to hire it and then take it as a credit against an invoice to the um, customer and that that administrator was literally going to be an assistant to the transformation manager, to the team, and her full-time job was to manage governance, schedule all the meetings, make all the agendas, make copies, get them scheduled, schedule travel arrangements for everybody, you name it. So like I said, this, there was a lot of money on the table, a lot of potential, and they decided to go ahead and invest in it. So this is what it looked like. And again, we had to take this to the executive committee for approval, but with this kind of slide, and then we had, I just looked at the deck, there were 75 slides, I think, all in total. It was a long, day-long meeting, but we really proved our point that this is what we needed, and it was approved. All right, so best practices in developing, and I've got some examples, again, from the same client. We use this model, which again is in my vested outsourcing manual. So at the top is the biggest V. These are the operational management groups. These are the folks that sit day to day. These should be peer to peer relationships sitting ideally within a locality, if not within a region, and they should meet virtually at least weekly if or you know, at a minimum monthly in order to manage the relationship. So you can see you're going to have to dedicate time and resources to do that. The next, which is in the middle, is the Joint Operations Committee. This is the middle management. This is this is an interesting layer that we really, really have to have. A lot of people in the operational management group do not have the authority to make some of the decisions around the day-to-day -day implementation of strategic initiatives. And so the way that we designed this operations committee is that it had the authority to make decisions, and it met monthly at the beginning and then quarterly afterwards after some of the initial transformation projects were well on their way. And that committee was authorized, and it was both the supplier and the, the customer, and they made decisions. And that way, you could be ensured that you didn't have someone at the service provider or at the customer level who were unwilling to make decisions because they just didn't have enough authority. And then one person is trying to run it up the food chain while somebody else is waiting, and it gets stuck. So instead, this was an automatic. These decisions went to the middle committee, and they made the decisions, yes, no, do it this way, costs money, doesn't cost money, those kinds of decisions. And then the Board of Advisors is overall sponsorship. So you can see how at level three you start to develop, if you've got the structure, the ability through the middle management and the Board of Advisors to keep its eye on strategic initiatives. And then the new sheriff in town has to join a board whether it's the middle management or the board of directors, so it tampens his or her ability to quote-unquote shake things up and disrupt an otherwise extremely profitable relationship or transformation initiative. So in theory, this is what you would produce, this kind of spreadsheet, and I've got one, so I'll show it to you. You have a committee, so operations, joint management, board of advisors. You've got the customers, members, the suppliers, members, their roles and their reporting. And as you can see, you know, there's a lot more names under operations and then there's just one name for joint management, maybe two or three, if it's going to be a global operations. And then the board of advisors is really at that point the decision makers. And so let me show you what that looks like because for the customer, we had head of North American real estate. That would be, quote, unquote, Taylor. All the names have been changed. Um, and then Gary was the president of the supplier, right? And so that's that's the level we're at because that's only the level that can really make strategic initiatives um, come to life. And then it's the joint management TV, the Mary, Mary Ann's and Lori's of the world who then um, translate that initiative into actions. And then it's the operations team that then implement those actions. So I know that this is small, but this is what it looks like. And so you've got a functional group. You've got the meeting frequency. You've got customer peer, again, all the names have been changed. You've got supplier peer, again, the names have been changed. You've got accountability. 
then you've got their individualized but roles and those individualized roles means all of the people in those middle boxes have those bullet points now as part of their job description for this relationship and then we have the reporting structure and in orange there were nine people on the customer side with five people on the on the peer side and this was the operational committee so this is the big v this is the people who are meeting weekly or monthly and the reason that there were so many is because they broke broke them up into regions now in this this is the management committee so I have a note here that the contract professional for the customer sits on this committee as well as the supplier's newly minted customer vendor relationship management so that, that those two colleagues were sitting at this point to ensure that all the third-party vendors that the supplier was working with as part of the supply chain had that full flow through of contract terms, scope of work, change initiatives, et cetera. So that's critical. So at this committee, there were four on the customer side and two on the uh, supplier side. And you can see here it was the North American account director sat in the middle because his boss, which was the president of the entire organization, sat on this. So it was the senior vice president of the customer over here, and it was from headquarters, not from the regional office, the president that sat. And so there was one peer on the customer side, but there were two peers. Um, you know, there was an, an additional, because of the structure, there was an additional person besides the president that was coming in order to make sure the strategic initiatives. I believe that person from, was from the financial area. And so again, group accountability and reporting. So you can see how this actually plays itself out. This is what it looks like. And this is scalable, folks. You can have these three tiers without having quite as many names, but you need a fair amount of structure if you're really going to drive a strategic initiative or go to market with an alliance partner so now we want to talk about moving into insight so the whole purpose of this is right we want to avoid the new sheriff in town doing things new just to do them new not because it's going to create value and we want to avoid strategic drift people lose attention move on to other things this relationship may have a three or five year horizon in order to reach its full potential so we have to move from oversight to insight. And so what you do is you want to tie the governance structure to a solid joint scorecard. And you want a clear understanding of the total cost of ownership for the relationship. So I'm tying all three of these webinars together here at this point. If you've done a total cost of ownership or you've done an activity-based ownership uh, expenses analysis, cost-benefit analysis, and you've got a joint scorecard in place, now you start moving from insight to oversight. And so this is what my client did. And this is very high level, and some of it's been scrubbed so that I could fit it into one slide and also keep confidentiality. But in this slide, you can see that there were six key performance indicators tied to a one-year bonus. And, and so what we had were six key performance indicators that the supplier scored the customer on and the customer scored the supplier on. So that meant that there was joint accountabilities. There were change management initiatives the customer needed to do in order to facilitate the change, and then there were things the supplier needed to do within its own organization and its third-party vendors to make sure that that change happened. Then there were three process metrics that were tied to a fee at risk, and those were only the supplier. The customer only scored the supplier. And so what that meant is that an entire end-to-end -end process that the supplier owned, there were only three of them that they owned in their entirety, they were measured, and if they didn't meet a threshold, then their fee was forfeited. So that's what for, fee for risk means. And then there were three operational metrics, again, that the supplier completely owned, meaning there were no handoffs between the customer and the supplier for that operational metric, and those three were so critical, they were also tied to a fee at risk. So if they didn't meet the threshold, their fees, their profit was at risk. Um, so this is how you can get to that point of insight, because if you're focusing on the C six key performance indicators where the customers and the suppliers are really grading each other in their ability to meet those 
key performance indicators, then you've got insight. What are we doing next quarter? What are we going to do for the next six months? What's next year going to look like? And you get this insight that enables really good structured strategic partnerships to go after market share and things like that. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be forever. You can get to a certain point, and then you can transition out of the relationship. But this is how you do that really intensely interdependent kind of relationship. And this can be scaled down if you've got other kinds of relationships that are independent, interdependent rather. You can scale this down, and I can certainly give you some ideas on how to do that. Now, we've got about four minutes left, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up those lines here in just a moment for questions. So everybody's on interactivity right now. So please, if you've got any questions, go ahead and let me know. While you're thinking about your questions, I'll go ahead and put up the last slide. If you want to learn more, please email me at jn at jniden.com. I've got a lot of information, YouTube videos, books, white papers, and I'd be happy to share it with you. All right, last call for questions. All right, thank you all very much. Hearing none, I genuinely appreciate it. i got a lot of people on the line today. I genuinely appreciate all of your time and attention. You guys have a great day.